Welcome to the Mobile Workforce Podcast, where we sit down and have real conversations with business leaders that have been where you are. During these interviews, we'll dive into what it takes to improve systems and champion processes that maximize performance. Each week, our trailblazing guests share their experiences and understanding of the workforce to help inspire change, challenge our thinking, and share what it takes to successfully travel the road to profitability. Now here's our host, co-founder and chief evangelist of About Time and WorkMax, Mike Merrill. Hello and welcome to the Mobile Workforce Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Merrill, and today we are sitting down with Nate Fuller. Nate is the founder and director of Placer Construction Solutions. And in today's episode, Nate and I are going to discuss the lag that many construction leaders are experiencing in digital solutions adoption. Uh, especially at the job site level, and why construction has inherited this problem from a project structure and how companies can best deal with this. So thank you, Nate, for joining us today. Looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks, Mike. Awesome. You bet. So when we talk about the digital adoption term, why is that important to the future of construction and what, what are we really talking about here? Yeah, well, I think you know construction companies love the idea of data. Um, and they love the idea of making data-driven decisions in their business. Um, but there's a big challenge in construction around how do we acquire that data? How do we get that data? How do we use that data in a, in a meaningful way? And, uh, and, and it's important because every other industry has been transformed or is un- undergoing a transformation. And I think we can all sense the fact that construction has lagged a little bit. So being able to figure that out and do that on a business by business basis is, is especially challenging in construction. There's some unique challenges I think that the industry as a whole faces. Um, but there are some ways to do it and, and, and that are unique to construction and ways to do it that um, make it work on a, on a, on a company by company basis. And, and, and I think a big piece of that is understanding the nature of the business and understanding your field workforce. Yeah. And I, uh, bringing up the field workforce, when I think of construction companies that I've visited with and been to their offices, you know, around the country and even internationally, some of these companies are pretty large and, and have pretty dynamic and sharp people in the office and IT infrastructure, even software engineers, programmers. I mean, there's some of these companies are doing some really powerful things, but I think where the wheels fall off the apple cart, sometimes it's it's out in the field, like you mentioned. What Why do you think that is and, and what do you think we could do to address that? Yeah, I mean, I think I think the the biggest challenge is this field based nature of construction, and and also the fact that it's project based. So what ends up happening is you have a project, you know, particularly for larger construction companies, that that project could last a year, maybe two years, maybe three years. Um, once the project is completed, all of the people on that project are kind of dispersed to the wind and go to a new project. And so it's really hard from a continuity of implementation perspective to draw that line across the business because the people are constantly on the move. I mean, mobile workforce, right? Um, people are constantly on the move, moving on to new projects. And so any technology solution that is applicable on one project may or may not be applicable on the next. Um, and so we come up with a lot of point solutions that are that are addressing specific pain points within specific areas of the project delivery. Um, but again, that continuity of implementation across projects becomes really challenging because the projects change and the people on those projects are constantly changing. And so what I focus on with my work is, is really understanding who the people are in the business and, and getting a good understanding of your field workforce and what their needs are and what their interests are and highlighting those specific individuals within the field teams that we can lean on for improving digital implementation and digital adoption. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And I think we've got really two swim lanes going on here. I mean, just because something's really amazing for the office and very powerful doesn't necessarily mean the field end of that is is going to be um, viewed the same, right? Exactly, and you know, there's there's gap, there's a huge gap in construction between the office and the field, and I think it's it's larger in construction perhaps than in, in a lot of other field based industries. Um, you know, it's a geographic gap. It can be a cultural gap. Um, and, and oftentimes times what ends up happening is you'll have folks in the office making d- procurement decisions around specific types of technology um, without a really clear understanding of what the field needs are. And, and so there's a, there's, a, there's a gap between the decision makers in the office and the folks in the field who are ultimately going to be the end users. 
Um, and so the construction companies that that do technology and do digital ad- adoption well are the ones that have a really innate understanding of their field teams and what their field teams need. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, you use the word understanding, and I think that's something that we need more of <laughs> when we're trying to bridge this gap. Um, obviously, you've got uh, digital adoption as, as a term that we hear quite a bit. What do you think the best approach is to help companies to really adopt these products that are digital in nature? Right. You know, it really it really depends on a on a business by business and a company by company um, nature. So one one of the other really unique things about construction is just how fragmented it is. I mean, we're talking about the fact that ninety percent of construction companies have less than twenty employees. Um, and and as far as that level of fragmentation, there's really no other industry on the planet that that is that fragmented. Um, what that means is that when we talk about construction, we're really talking about a lot of very big industry sectors and a lot of different companies of different sizes. And so it's really, as a, from the startup's perspective or a technology provider's perspective, understanding that construction isn't just this big monolithic industry, I think is, is the first step. Um, you're not going to create a solution that is a silver bullet that's going to solve every problem for every single construction company on the planet. It's just not going to happen because there's there's way way too many nuances and caveats for for each of those companies within this very fragmented space. Um, so st- really staying focused on one particular part of construction or one pain point within the construction value chain is really important. And even within the construction firm itself, understanding the nature of your business, how how your business is making money, what your field teams are doing is going to vary on a case by case basis as well. Um, because, yeah, again, you know, it's 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 not it's it's never the same across uh, across uh, different construction companies. So that really that's step number one. And then the second step, once once you've kind of figured out where your pain points are or what processes within the field can be improved using new digital tools or emerging technologies, you know, really understanding who are the, what I call field influencers that are going to be instrumental in the adoption of that technology or that point solution that we're looking to adopt across the business. Um, and those field influences are really important because those are kind of the, we'll call them the soft power out in the field who are going to help improve adoption and, and make sure that it's not just, you know, rejected at, uh, you know, um, rejected once it once it hits the ground. Um, so uh, identifying who those field influencers are and really leaning on them to you know get feedback about the product that we're implementing, and then also lean on them to help improve the actual implementation is is really key as well. Yeah, that's very much in alignment with what we see as well. I think we usually take a train the trainer approach, so to speak, where we find those champions and then we try and build around that nucleus and. And hopefully the the stickiness factor goes up and the complaining and the whining about it goes down. It sounds like you're seeing a very similar thing in your experience. Yeah. And I think, I think the technology providers have a stake in that as well. I think a lot of the tools that have been historically developed for construction have been these kind of back office tools. Um, and, and there's a lot of reasons for that. I think the field-based nature of, of construction makes it difficult to get computers on job sites. But I mean, look, we have these supercomputers in our pockets now. So it's not the technology that's necessarily holding us back. It's it's the ability to use technology in a meaningful way. And so I think technology providers, you know, there's a there's a, a very active, robust construction technology ecosystem that's developed over the past 10 years. You know, these folks really are beginning to step up and understand that, um, that the field is where it's at in construction and, you know, understanding how to use technology and get technology used in a useful way, um, out in the field in construction is a huge part of the, the solution to, you know, this huge productivity gap that the industry faces. Yeah. So when you're talking about these field influencers or, um, embedded leaders, whatever you want to refer to them as, is there a rule of thumb ratio or some some approach that you try and take to make sure that you have enough coverage? 
Yeah, so typ- typically what we look to uh, highlight is about 5 to 10% of the organization. So when you when you talk about digital transformation, and this the topic can get a little heady, a little too heady sometimes, um, <laughs> but you know, the idea of digital transformation is the idea that the industry needs to really reinvent itself around um, uh, uh, digital applications and, and, and take a more data-driven approach to operations of their business. And in, or, in order to achieve that, in order to begin digitizing a lot of the processes um, within the industry, you know, you need about five to 10% of the business bought into it. You don't need everyone. And there's going to be a lot of laggards, right? There's going to be folks that are just, they've been doing it uh, for, you know, 50 years and they're not changing how they're doing it. And, and, and that's okay. You know, you, you know, we, we don't need to win everyone over. Um, so what that means in practice, you know, the five to 10% is if you're looking at an organization of a thousand people, you need about a hundred, hundred folks that are really bought in and, and helping carry the banner for, um, digital adoption and new digital tools. Yeah, it's, this is very interesting because that's a, that's a very similar ratio to exactly what we see. We, we think that every uh, leader to every five to 10 field people is, is optimal. So, yeah. and, and, um, yeah, anyway, go ahead. So, well, yeah, so I think along that line, then, uh, it sounds like it's just absolutely critical that you get those champions established, that you figure out how to um, take that approach. What do, you, what do you do to help make sure that that happens? Right. You know, it's actually really, it's a really difficult thing to do in construction, finding who those people are. And the bigger the construction organization is, the more challenging it can get. You know, I spent the first nearly 10 years of my career at Bechtel, one of the largest construction companies, at least in North America, if not the world, um, you know, help build out their office of innovation. And, and I can say from experience that identifying who those individuals are is really challenging. And, and, and a lot of times what we do is we in construction, because construction is not, or has not historically been a very technology focused industry. Um, you know, what we oftentimes end up doing is take a very construction project management approach to it, you know, bring in a handful, three, four leaders to really carry the banner for technology. And then it's, you know, essentially rely on those people to take the company into the future. And and I want to say that, 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 that approach falls flat pretty quickly. If, if we're not going out and we're not identifying all of those other individuals around the business who um, are going to be kind of our allies in this digital transformation, the the challenge in construction goes back to that field-based, project-based nature of the work. Um, very quickly, what you'll see in large construction organizations is that you lose track of all those people because, because every couple of years, they're on a new project. And, and so, so highlighting and understanding who those people are can be really difficult. Um, and, and it goes beyond just, you know, Nate knows... 10 people and Mike knows 10 people, but those 10 people know 10 other people and those 10 other people know 10 other people as well. And so highlighting who those individuals are that are kind of the glue within the technology conversation across this huge, expansive field-based organization is like 90% of the challenge. So that's, that's the, that's, that's the field influencers approach to doing technology and construction is, is highlighting who, who's the glue that's kind of holding together all of these conversations. Yeah. I love that term. That's a, that's a great term. The glue that holds that conversation together from the technology perspective. I like that. So what, so when you run into cases where the employees are resistant or you don't have, you don't have that uh, buy-in from those embedded influencers, what do you do? How do you address that? Well, typically what ends up happening is that those those influencers, those embedded leaders, are, they're off doing whatever they need to do on their project to get stuff done. And so if, if, you, if you don't highlight those individuals and you don't bring them into the, conver- you know, the kind of the wider enterprise-wide conversation around technology, they'll, they'll, they'll be forming their whole you know, little shadow IT department that are out there on projects doing whatever they need to do to get stuff done. And, and there's, there's no enterprise view of that or no strategy behind it. And so if you don't know who those folks are, you should, because they're going to be out there doing stuff anyway, and just, just getting stuff done because they need to, the project needs to get delivered and, um, and they're running at a million miles an hour. Um, so, th- so they're going to exist and they're going to be doing stuff from a technology perspective, whether or not it's quote unquote approved. Um, of course, you know, what they're doing is probably necessary in order to get the project completed. So it's, 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 it's not 
advise to like slam the brakes on everything. But what you want to do is you want to you you want to understand who those folks are, kind of what they're doing, what pain points are they solving for through these shadow IT applications, and then pro- start begin providing some structure to it and seeing if there's an enterprise approach that we can take to these technology implementations. Yeah, I love that analogy, and I love that you pointed that out. I've I've never really heard anyone on the podcast um, speak about it in that way, and it also makes me think while you have people that are, like you said, kind of having their own little IT situation going on, doing the things they want to do, I think there's another group that is almost resistant to the technology and they're trying to force the old school approach that they're used to. And so you really could have three silos of or three camps in this technology conversation that are all acting independently and, and operating, you know, maybe not uh in an opposite directions all the time because they're moving the project forward, but it, it definitely doesn't help the whole team win together. Yeah. Look, I mean, at the end of the day, a lot of construction is not digital. I mean, we're building things, we're building real things and, and we're using our hands and tools to get it built. Um, but there's a lot of processes out in the field um, that, that we're doing that are paper-based currently that could very easily be digitized, right? And we're, you know, we're talking about safety audits, uh, safety inspections, incident reports, checklists. Um, so a lot of the shadow IT revolves around digitizing those processes. And, and I don't know that there's a ton of resistance to that. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that there's an old school guy that's like, no, I'm not going to, you know, ent- enter information into the Excel spreadsheet because I'm used to doing it on paper. Like, you know, for, for the most part, like, I think people are okay with that. Um, so we're not, ta- we're not talking about like completely reinventing um, the way that we're building projects. What we're talking about is, is making it, making it more, um, making more digitized workflows, more digitized processes in the field that are going to allow us to be, to work more productively and more efficiently. Um, so, but to your point, I think, you know, there are certainly laggards. There might be some guys out there that just, you know, for whatever reason are not going to give up their, you know, paper and pencil. And, you know, I think, I think the, uh, the digitized workflows will eventually win that battle. Yeah. And I see one other thing that we run into and, and you probably have too, is you have people that might actually be trying to sabotage some of these things too, because they, they don't want to change. So they're, they're happy when the wheels fall off of something or there's an error above or they can't get a connection or something doesn't save or whatever, whatever excuse or reason that they may share. What, what have you done or seen done to address those types of things? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's easier said than done. Um, in a lot of cases, I just, I, I typically focus on the folks that are kind of driving things forward and really empowering them and giving them the air cover to be able to, 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 to do what they need to do in order to, you know, begin digitizing these, these processes. Um, I, I don't know that, that that's an easy question to answer. It's really on a organization and organization in a case by case basis. But I, but I think in general, my philosophy is like, let's go out, let's find the, these field influencers, let's empower them to take chances around use of new technologies and support them in that effort. You know, as long as we're doing our work safely, right. Um, let's support them in that effort and, uh, and, and see how the chips fall. Because I think we all know that eventually we're going to get there. One of these is going to win out. Um, so, so I think empowering those individuals is probably the first step. And, and I think bringing like that five, again, that five to 10% of the organization along, along with you is, um, is, is really the, the key to it all. Yeah. And as I read between the lines from what I just heard you say, it sounds like, and I really like this advice. It sounds like you're saying, look, just stay the course. Like the, this is going to work out. You just have to keep going. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, we're, we're, we're putting bets on different ideas around the business, different individuals around the business who are, who are in touch with field operations and they, they know where the pain points are and, and we're putting bets on those individuals and some of those bets, you know, it's like any bet, some are going to pay off, some aren't, but in the long run, we know that, you know, for the sake of the, the business and future proofing it, um, that we have to make those bets in order to be successful in the long run. Yeah. And to your point, if, if you decide to take no action and continue forward, well, you already know what those results are. That's what you're already getting, right? Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, I, I, re- I really do believe that in the next 10 years, the, the construction organizations that 
have technology figured out are the ones that are going to be around. Um, you know, just from a from a safety, from a from an efficiency, from a productivity perspective, digitizing um, our workflows and our, our work processes in the field is is pretty much existential in the long run. Um, you know, I think I think a lot of companies are going to continue kind of chugging along for the next decade or so, and 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 they're going to be successful in the way they've done construction work traditionally. Um, but uh, but I think eventually, you know. The future is going to catch up to them. Yeah, that's a great point. I think one other thing that keeps coming to my mind as we're having this conversation, and I'd love to get your take on it, how critical, and this is, I mean, really for the listeners, I, I hope they really pay attention to this. How critical is executive and management buy-in on these types of solutions? And, and when there's a problem there, what happens and what does that cost somebody? Yeah, well, I mean, it, it, it's cr- from from the executive buy-in perspective, I mean, it's crucial, right? Um, you know, I think any any large scale enterprise wide initiative needs to have the air cover and the support of leadership. Um, you know, I think we can take that to an extreme. And, and I kind of touched on it earlier where I said, you know, if we just put a handful of folks in charge of the entire technology mandate for the entire construction organization and, and fully empower those leadership teams to do everything, then that's also a recipe for failure. So it's this mix between executive leadership providing air cover for this transformation of the business. Um, but then also kind of that field operations, meeting them halfway um, through these field influencers and through these embedded leaders and bringing all of that together as a, as an organizational mandate is kind of the, is the key to making it a success. Yeah. When I hear you use a term like organizational mandate, I mean, that, that sounds like that's like mission critical. Like this is where the ship is going you got to get on or you got to get off. And, and I mean, would you, would you state it in such a firm way? Yeah, no, I, I, I definitely think so. I definitely think that the companies that, that do it well in the next five years are the ones that are going to be around in the next 10. That's great. I, I totally agree with that. So what is something that to you seems surprising that you're seeing out there today that, that has taken hold and, and companies are really leveraging? You know, a lot of it's pretty low-hanging fruit. So things like digital drawings, right? Um, a technology that even five, ten years ago wasn't widely adopted is becoming more and more adopted. Um, you know, digital drawings are one. A lot, a lot of construction companies are beginning to, especially the large organizations, are beginning to put together what they call virtual design and construction teams within the organization. So these are folks who have specialty in uh, building information models. Um, so, so digitizing the the design. Um, and then essentially handing that over to the field to build and kind of and, and steering away from kind of this old paper-based way of doing things. Um, so, you know, what, what that does is it really opens up a lot of opportunities for just the way that the project is delivered as a whole. So across the entire project lifecycle, if you can digitize everything from the, you know, early uh, feasibility through design, through execution, to handover, you've basically digitized everything at that point. And I think building information models are um, are, are crucial to that. Um, but look, a lot of, like I said, you know, 90% of construction companies are less than 20 employees. So the vast majority of construction companies are not going to have, um, you know, VDC teams to, to, to lean on to do this stuff. Um, so, you know, I think that's where technology providers really need to step up and and begin making tools that essentially outsource the what a traditional VDC team would do within a large construction organization and maybe not have all of the bells and whistles that you that would come with with it um, but provide that access to that those types of tools those BIM tools to you know that huge base of the construction industry that that exists um, but yeah again it's just a, it's the digitization across the entire design through execution and into handover um, because at the end of the day, you know, we're, we're past the point of handing over a big stack of document, paper documents to the, to the customer um, at, the, at handover time. You know, we, we can really begin to hand over, you know, digitally and, and, and make all of those processes much more efficient. Yeah, when you talk about handover, one of the things that I've brought up here before in other conversations is, is you're essentially able to deliver an owner's manual to the new owner of this, of this project, right? It's all digitized. Exactly. Yeah, it's all digitized and 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 accessible. You know, you're not you're not sorting through a file cabinet full of uh, specifications and contracts. 
And then also uh, just the safety factor of things like collision detection or not not do, putting things up that you're ultimately going to have to take back down and then, you know, readdress a different way because you, you know, you didn't realize until you actually got the, the parts and pieces in place that, you know, this just wasn't going to work, right? That's right. Yeah. So, you know, the clash detection for things like constructability reviews, you know, um, be, being able to get foremen and superintendents into an environment where they're able to review the design before they bring all the trades in and realize, oh, you know, this is, isn't where it's supposed to be, or it's, it, it's, it's, you know, this trade is clashing with that trade at this time. Um, you can do all of those reviews digitally and remotely. Um, and, and what that does is it ends up saving a lot of time and headache and heartburn on the project once you're out there and you, and, and, and these clashes eventually become realized. Yeah. And I like, you actually mentioned the heartburn word at the end, because even though we, we like to look at things from a monetary and a scheduling perspective, that heartburn is what can bite you later in different ways. And, and I think there's, there's hidden money there that we lose sometimes because of excessive heartburn, right? Yeah. 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 And, 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 and just that efficiency, the process efficiency of being able to bring people in and not, you know, be at each other's throat because they're ticked off at the other guy because they weren't there on time or they didn't know that they needed to be there, you know, be, being able to really streamline those processes in the field um, through the use of digital tools. Yeah. The, or the chip on the shoulder from, because the last project that we ran into this, you know, uh, when I was a builder I actually had, I, I took a picture of it. I'll have to look it up and see if I can, dig it out of my archive somewhere, but, um, but I actually had an electrician who drilled a, a inch and a half hole through a plumbing line and fished his wire through it. So I don't know if it was intentional and he wanted to prove a point. I don't know if it was, you know, somebody really truly wasn't paying attention or they had the, the, the new, the newest guy that just got hired that day do this, but it was, a. Uh, it was kind of funny and, and uh, something we joked about later, but I have seen those types of things where subcontractors are, are literally, you know, sabotaging each other and causing each other problems over things like that. Totally, totally. And, 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 and you, like, you like to think that people are going to be on their best behavior, but it's not always the case. Yeah, no question about that. So, so we talked about what uh, the low-hanging fruit is that you have noticed and that uh, is good to see. What are some of the things that surprise you that aren't happening that you think companies really are missing the boat on and, and should be spending more time and focus on trying to adopt? That's a good question. Um, again, I mean, it's so much of it comes back to this case by case, business by business um, perspective and the way that the industry is fragmented. So it really, it really depends on which part of the industry we're talking about. Um, you know, digital drawings are kind of a no brainer at this point. I'll be honest, like, the, 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 the ability to use, you know, something, a service like plan grid or blue beam, um, you know, they're all very affordable, um, and, and, and very useful. Uh, I think the craft genuinely enjoy it at this point. And, um, and so that's, that's, that's one that's a slam dunk. Things like e-ticketing is another one, right? So, you know, e uh, electronic ticketing for, you know, batch plants and aggregate delivery, um, yeah, those, those are the those are the two big ones. But then, you know, there's also just digitizing basic workflows. So safety inspections, right? You know, there's a handful of services out there that allow us to do, um, you know, safe, safety walk downs digitally and, uh, you know, very quickly using, again, these supercomputers in our pocket flag, you know, unsafe conditions in the job site and, and get them uh, resolved quickly. Um, so those are those are the three big ones in my mind. That's great. So lots of great information shared today. If you were going to pick one thing that, that you hope people walk away with after hearing our conversation, what would you have them remember? You know, I would have them remember to to build a technology program around your field influencers and identifying quickly who those embedded leaders are. And particularly for large construction organizations, this isn't, you know, five or six people. These are dozens of individuals out in your field team who are going to be the soft power that really drive the transformation of your business. Oh man, I love that you just said that. I, I don't think anybody's ever said those words on this podcast to date, and I could not agree more. Uh, start with the field, right? And, uh, and if you do that, then the office will figure this stuff out, right? I love it. Uh, all right. Well, a couple of questions to wrap up a little more on a personal side. So what's something that you've uh, learn to become super grateful for in your professional life? 
You know, actually, Zoom. I I, I feel like I feel I feel like uh, you know a lot of the 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 tools that we've leaned on during COVID. I mean, obviously, it's been a very challenging couple of years for us personally and also for the industry. Um, but you know, the the digital tools that we now take for granted are are ones that um, that are going to be super useful into the future. So so things like you know zoom and you know mobile communication um that we use in our day-to-day lives are something that we're, we can also begin to leverage and use in our construction work as well yeah it's enhanced a lot of things hasn't it here we are <laughs> <laughs> yeah great <laughs> touche <laughs> all right so last question so what what nate do you think has become what you'd call your superpower in life you know really taking that bird's eye view of a problem and a challenge and 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 working with people out in construction organizations to put together a, a really robust strategy that's founded in reality that's data driven that understands the nuances of construction and the challenges of construction um, but you know building out building out teams that are able to actually go out and execute on that and and, and really make a difference oh, i love that that's fantastic well, you're doing some great work out there. I've loved this conversation. I think uh, we definitely need to jump on and, and have some more discussions. I think you got a lot of wisdom to share with the industry, and we just appreciate you joining us today for a few minutes. I appreciate you taking the time. Thanks, Mike. All right, brother. Take care. See ya. See ya. Thank you for joining us today on the Mobile Workforce Podcast, sponsored by About Time Technologies and WorkMax. If you liked the conversation we had today or were able to learn anything new or helpful, Please make sure to follow us on our WorkMax page on LinkedIn and on Instagram at WorkMax underscore. And subscribe to the show on iTunes or your preferred podcast platform so you will never miss another insightful episode. Also, if you enjoyed the podcast, please leave us a five-star rating and review and share the show with your friends and colleagues. Your support means the world to us and will allow us to continue providing impactful information with others looking to improve their results in their business and in turn, their life.